there's actually science that the Department of Defense is doing where they're researching your sixth sense and they found that it actually works in the field because some of the military out in the field have been um, able to avoid IEDs, explosive devices, improvised explosive devices. And so when they asked them, how did you know not to go this way? I had a feeling. Mm -hmm. And so even if you can't articulate it, even if you don't understand it, if you feel it, follow it. I'm Lisa Billiou, and I went from housewife to co-founder of the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize that you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. Have you ever had that unsettling feeling that you're being watched and you look around and you don't see anyone, so you shrug it off as paranoia? or as a sign that you should put down the TV remote because clearly you've been watching too many episodes of CSI. Have you ever met someone for the first time and there's just something about them that makes you uneasy? You can't quite put your finger on it, but you're not comfortable being around them. So you tell your friend not to leave you alone with them and they look at you like you're nuts. Hmm, maybe that marathon of binge watching Mindhunter last weekend wasn't the best idea. Intuition, gut feelings, all things we are taught to rely on growing up and yet often ignore when they strike, sometimes out of fear of embarrassing ourselves for overreacting. Well, tell that to Carol Duranch, the woman who, while riding in what she thought was a police officer's Volkswagen bug, decided to trust her instincts that something just wasn't quite right. Turns out she was right, and that police officer turned out to be none other than serial killer Ted Bundy. So how do we know and assess when someone is blatantly lying to us, taking advantage of us, or manipulating us, or when it's just our wild imaginations running away with us? A question that if we can figure out can impact all aspects of our life, from relationships to business to personal safety, and literally in some cases it can be life or death. Well today's badass is going to tell us just that. With a Master of Arts in Forensic Psychology, this former Secret Service agent was part of the protective detail for President Obama, George W. Bush, and President Clinton. Working complex undercover operations and criminal investigations, she took on classified missions from Beirut to Russia. With a resume more impressive than Parasite sweeping the Oscars, this former interrogator for the Department of Defense Elite Polygraph Unit is now using her experience and training to demonstrate in her new book, Becoming Bulletproof, how we can protect ourselves, read people, influence situations, and overcome our fear using natural instincts in order to live fearlessly. So guys, please help me in welcoming the recipient of the Secret Service Medal of Valor Award for her heroism on 9-11, which, by the way, only five women in all of the US Secret Service history have ever received. A former interrogator, journalist, and now public speaker, the human lie detector, Evi Pomporas. Thank you. Yasu <laughs> Diganis. Very good, thank you. My fellow Greek in the house. Yes, we are busting out the Greek. We are. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're on here. I've been waiting for you to come on. So excited about what you've done and how you identify these moments of, you know, you're fearful or threat. And that's where I actually thought I was going to start this episode until I started to research you more and realize just you entering the Secret Service, what you had to do with your mind has been incredible. And that you said that you had to build mental armor in order to be part of it. And that the Secret Service have to basically break you down in order to build you back up. Talk to me about that and what it takes to build mental armor. Well, usually when you go through these types of academies, one of the things they do is they break you down. They, they're not there to tell you, keep going, good job. Like You will not hear any of that stuff. They put you through a lot of stress. And part of the psychology uh, behind that is, it's actually called a hermetic effect, where you, give, you induce small amounts of stress into someone, and those small amounts of stress, when they happen, you learn to cope with them. And so you cope. Greater stress, you learn to cope. Greater stress, you learn to cope. And so what happens is you are a very different person from the day you show up, day one, to the day you leave because that they are helping build your resilience. Mm. And building mental resilience is having stress in your life, which is really goes against everything else that you hear. It's like, oh, live stress-free. You don't want stress in your life. Everything should be zen. It's the exact opposite because if you're not 
Think of it this way, if you're not dealing with any stress, if you're not dealing with adversity, you're not dealing with obstacles, then when something does happen, you're not gonna know what to do. Stress is good, certain levels of stress are good. They teach you how to, to cope, they teach you how to problem solve, they teach you how to fail, and then to do better the next time. So training is like that. They break you down and they also wanna see who you are when you are stressed out. Because when you're stressed, you act, you don't really get to think. Mm. And a big part of that is you want to see somebody's true nature, stress them out and see who they are. You know, people, it's, it'll tell you a lot about somebody when they're not actually thinking about what do I do here? And can you think under stress? Not everybody can. Mm. So when you're under that amount of stress, what do you personally tell yourself to get through it? Because I've heard you say that um, it's not only such a male dominated field, but it's like one of the hardest male dominated fields. Um, so for you, like, how do you level up to perform at the level that they expect ev like, the men to perform? The truth is, Lisa, I don't know. Because I didn't go in there thinking, oh, I'm a woman. Oh, it's gonna be harder for me. Oh, they're not gonna want me. It didn't matter to me. Because if, you, if I went in with that mindset, I'm a woman, because right then and there, I'm just, I'm defeating myself. Because I'm thinking, be because I'm a woman, First of all, I'm making it a negative that I am a woman and it's a problem. Mm. And so now psychologically, I'm putting myself, before anybody even had a chance to put me at a disadvantage, I just put myself at a, at a disadvantage because I'm, and you know, fill in the blank. I am a, put your race, put your ethnicity, put your gender, put whatever you want. I am this, no one's gonna like me. But you show people who you are. Mm. If you sit there and you're verbally trying to convince everybody, hey, I should be here. Hey, you should respect me. Hey, you should this. You're going you're gonna to go bananas. And so you just perform. So in areas where I was weak, I performed. If, if I had to run, look, I was not a great runner. I never had to run before. And so I went into the academy and I was like, the running we did was, it was beyond running. It was just running with gear on. It was running with boots on. It was running just for miles and miles. It's running in the heat and the freezing cold. I had to work on it. And so when we finished running during the day in training, guess what I did at night? I went running. And so there's, there's this level of psychology. It's like I didn't, I was, I was there. I had earned my place there and I was staying. I wasn't going anywhere. So beyond that, you have, we have so much power. We don't realize and we think that when we hear this noise or chatter around us, it's up to you how much you let it penetrate you. It's like you create, create this mental shield. So it's, who do you let in and what do you keep out? If after I did all these things, people still had an issue with me, despite outperforming even them, then at that point, you know, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. Mm. And so sometimes it's like, I'm actually not weak. You're the one who's weak, right? Weak people push other people down so that they can feel stronger. Hearing people's opinions is important because they can help guide you. But it's also important to know which opinions you should listen to and when you you know, which opinions you should not listen to. Mm. Can you differentiate the difference between those that matter and those that don't? How do you decide that? You know, in my case, when I went, my first week of training actually with the service academy, I remember some guys pulled me aside and they said, they, some people don't want you here. They don't think you should be here. And I remember being, thinking to myself, I just showed up. How do people not want me? And the reply was, well, they think that you're physically not capable to do this job. And at that point, I was like, all right, well, I'll show you. And so it wasn't about me getting into an argument and debating it. It was about doing it. And I think a, we, we do is we process things in our head. And sometimes thinking, 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 worrying, all that stuff, we create our own mental chatter and it distracts us from actually moving forward. Mm. And I focused on putting one foot in front of the other. If I sat there and I thought, oh my God, how am I going to get through the next six months, that would have been very difficult. But it's like, how am I gonna get through the next five minutes? How am I gonna get through the next class? How am I gonna get through the next hour of shooting? How am I going to get through the next hour of combat training? And that's how I did it, that's how I approached it. But when you see that you're doing all these things and you're doing well, you also have to check in with yourself. Am I doing everything I can? Yes, I am. Am I succeeding? Yes, I am. So it's not me. It's you. Mm. But if I'm falling short, if I'm not going running at night, if I'm not training hard at night, and I just show up there waiting for people to accept me, well then, now it's me. And so a lot of it is self-assessment. It's 50% you, and then it's 50% the other person. 
but you really have to be honest with yourself. If you, if you're blaming everybody outside of you for what's going wrong, wrong, for what's happening, for why this, why that, this person doesn't like me, this person doesn't respect me. If you're so focused on that person, you're not looking at you. Yeah. God, I love everything you just said. Like, I'm such a believer of like, be so good they can't ignore you. Like concentrating on yourself, being so good at what you're doing that everyone around, around you literally cannot ignore you because you're that good. And so proving it, I absolutely love that, absolutely resonates with me. Um, and I love what you said is like earning respect. You can't persuade someone to give you respect. You have to earn You it. can't make people respect you. Right. Respect is a gift. If somebody wants to give it to you, they will. And if they don't, they don't. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something freeing in that and knowing that I do everything I needed to do, I'm letting it go. If you want to respect me, you can. And if you don't want to give it, that's fine too. You can't force it. And, and in some sense, you don't need it. Oh. You don't need it. So when you walked into, let's say, interrogation rooms, um, is respect even on the table? Is that, a, is that a, something that is important in those moments? So it's interesting because before I became an interrogator, I didn't want to become one. It was a polygraph examiner. And my job was to step in and get confessions from people for cases where we had a difficulty. We didn't have enough proof or the person wasn't confessing and this, this person would get away with a crime. And initially, I didn't want to be an interrogator. I thought, who's going to talk to me? They're going to see me. They're going to high five themselves and be like, oh, this is going to be easy. And I'm happy in this situation that the senior examiner believed in me more than I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you will be good at this because no one's going to see you coming. <laughs> no one's going to see it coming. They're going to underestimate you. Right. And that's a positive thing. And, you know, and I was like, well, you know, how am I going to get people to respect me in the room? What if I have an issue? And one of the things he also told me is like, don't force it command respect. So we would do simple things like, hi, how are you? Evie, nice to meet you. Have a seat. I'd show you where to sit. Um, it was my room. I'd have a maneuver where, um, for example, like my chair had wheels on it. The person's chair whom I was inter interviewing didn't have wheels on it. The psychology behind that was, I can move around. This is my room. You're stuck in that chair. And so there, there are certain little things that I could do to show you I was in charge rather than tell you I was in charge. One of the things they warned me about, they said, don't tell people that you're the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the authority. You listen to me. The minute those words come out of your mouth, you just did the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. You just lost all credibility. When you have to tell somebody you're the boss, do you think they don't know you're the boss? If I said to the person, hey, I'm the special agent, do you think they didn't know <laughs> they were sitting across from a special right. agent? And so it takes away from you. Yeah. And so it's less this and more showing through action. How do you carry yourself? How do you walk into a room? How do you speak? How do you project your voice? All those things exude power and all those things command respect. Mm. That's amazing. Um, I, I love that. And I think that everything that you say really does apply to just the real world. Like obviously you live in this or you have lived in this like unique situation, but with walking into a room, um, you know, a lot of people fear going into social, you know, rooms socially. It's like they, they don't feel confident enough. And so having a certain body presence, um, things like that, I just find fascinating. Talk to me about like appearance and things like that on how um, looks really do matter. I know the people say, oh, it's on the inside that counts, you know, not what's on the outside. Yeah, no. Think of it this way. If nobody knows you, all they have to judge you by is what they see. Mm -hmm. And some research shows that within the first five seconds, people make their impression of you. And it's so difficult to undo somebody's first impression of you. And it takes work to undo it if it's negative, if, the, if it is the image that you don't want. And so think about what are you exuding? How are you dressed? Think about the audience. You're going to wear one outfit for something else and a different outfit for something else. When I was an agent, my hair was always pulled back. I wore dark colors. I wore a suit. I wore flat, flat shoes. Mm. I had a stern look. There was a look that went with what I was doing. But that was the version of myself that I brought out. Mm. There are different versions of ourselves. There's no one you. And when I hear terms like, oh, I'm just going to go be me and see how it goes. I'm just going to be myself. Good luck with that. What version of you are you bringing to the table? Mm. You have to know your audience. Who are you speaking to? Mm. Because different versions of you resonate with different people. There's a version of you with your parents. There's a version of you when you do these interviews. There's a version of you with your husband. There's a version of you with your employees. 
So which version of you resonates with certain people? And then understanding the human being across from you, you adjust to them. One of the skills of influence, which I actually talk about in my book, is knowing who your audience is. Then based on who they are, how you assess them, you adjust yourself. You bring out the version of yourself that will speak to them, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and I love that. And do you always start with what is your goal? So like, if my goal is for this person to like me, then I adjust accordingly. If this person, uh, my goal is for this person to fear me, then I adjust accordingly. Do you, do you start with a goal like that? I won't start with a goal like that because not that I, I don't care if somebody likes me or fears me per sake because that's not my goal. My goal is what do I want? My goal is do I want to make a deal with this person? Do I want to sell a book? Do I want to do a show? Do I want to get a confession? Do I want to get an interview? That's my goal. My goal isn't how I want that person to feel about me. Interesting. Okay. My goal is what do I want? My end result is this and how do I navigate my conversation to get to that point? Now likability is important. If people like you, they are more likely to say yes to you. So, you know, the whole concept of like, I don't care if people like me, you should care mm -hmm. because it makes a difference. But going into a room saying, I want this person to like me, why? Mm. Now you're trying to figure them out and what makes them happy. It's like, well, what's your goal? Your goal is to make a partnership, do a podcast, do an interview, whatever it is. That's your goal. And then you navigate that. And fear, you want to be careful because... Do you really want people to fear you? There's some research out there, some science-based research, and one of the things that they found is those people that have the best communication skills and negotiation are better that, at influencing people are those that have two components. They are competent and they, they are warm. Mm. Okay? So we think, oh, I need to be competent and cold. That's not what resonates with people. It's competence and warmth. So how do you do that when you're walking into a room and someone's potentially killed somebody or um, like how do you be warm to that? And I've heard you say that you can't let your emotions, you know, rule you and you can't walk into any of those situations with any type of biasness. I think anyone listening has always been has been in a situation where they are biased because of their experiences and they walk into either a relationship or a friendship bringing those biases with them. Um, and taking things personally. So those are two skill sets I've heard you talk about that are so fascinating on how you actually do that. This is the thing. It's not about me. This is, it goes back to like, do I want people to like me and fear me? I'm making it about me. What's my goal? My goal is to get information, to get a confession, to find out did this person do it or did this person not do it? It's not about me. And what we do is our ego gets in the way. Me, 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 me. Does this person like me? This person disrespected me and I get lost. Now it's not about what I need. It's about me. And so when I walked into that room, what mattered was the information that I needed so that this person, for example, if it was a child abuse case or child sexual, sexual abuse case, and I, sadly I worked a lot of those, it wasn't about me telling this guy what I thought of him. It was about me getting information so that this guy or gal, it went both ways, couldn't hurt anybody else. That's what mattered. And so if you're able to get yourself out of the way and focus on what the long game is, the long game is I want X. How do I get to X? So me rolling my eyes, telling that person what a piece of garbage I thought he was or she was, it didn't matter. That's not what the point was. And truly, you can find something good in everybody. I interviewed mm. hundreds of people and I can't say that I ever interviewed somebody where I was like, this person is 100% pure evil. Really? You can find good qualities in people. And so if you can find those qualities and chase the good, I called it chasing the good, find the good things in them and pull them out. Mm -hmm. Because if I only point out all the bad things about you and I highlight how bad you are, how horrible you are, all the bad things you did, then I'm going to pull the bad part of Lisa out. But if I can find the good parts of Lisa and say, Lisa, I know you're an honest person. Lisa, I know you meant well. Lisa, I know you didn't mean this. At least I know you're a good daughter. If I can find those things about you, mm. because they exist, then I pull out the good part of Lisa. And the good Lisa wants to talk, wants to do the right thing, wants to communicate and work with me. The bad part of Lisa is going to go tell, flip me off yeah. and go tell me to myself. Yeah. Right? And so it's really being beyond yourself. People lie to me all the time. They still lie to me. Every day people lie. Everybody lies. I lie, you lie. 
Some research says that in one conversation, a person will tell 10 lies. What? Oh, yes. We shield ourselves. And look, we lie for different things. We lie because we don't want to give, you know, we don't want people to know our personal stuff. We lie to protect ourselves. We lie because we're hiding something. So if you can take that personal element out of it, oh, that person lied to me because they think I'm stupid, it probably has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. And think to yourself, why did they lie to me? Because of something going on within them. And if you can flip it around and not take it personal, you'll be able to see what the big picture is. Short picture, short run, you hurt my feelings. Big picture, I want X, how do I get to X? Mm. God, I love that. Have you always naturally been like that? Because sometimes, at least in the past, and I've really worked on this, my emotions almost just take over without me being able to control them. And so in an effort to control them, I may walk away from a situation, take a deep breath, things like that. But when you're in that sort of high intense atmosphere, is it that you've just trained yourself enough to not get to that point of like really being emotional? Or have you always been um, somewhat able to separate the two? No, so I had a terrible temper growing up. Okay. Uh, I wanted to fight everybody. Oh my God, and I grew up in New York and Queens, God help you. Greek and New York, you're done. Greek and Queens is like, <laughs> did you see how she looked at me? Hold my jacket, oh my God. I, I saw her look at me, she's gonna get it. All right, so how on earth did that girl from Queens end up being this person that is so articulate, able to explain everything? Like Self-assessment. You have okay. to constantly self-assess. I would look at situations and, for example, if I was fighting with a lot of different people in my relationships, mm. I would think to myself, well, there's one common denominator, mm -hmm. me. What am I doing? And I've learned over the years, if something goes wrong, not to say, what did that person do to me? I ask myself, what could I have done differently? Or what could mm. I have done to change the outcome? Because I can't control what another person does but I can fully control myself. And you said something really remarkable and that I agree with. When you get emotional, which I still do, the best thing to do is if you can is walk away, take a break. So don't send that angry text. Don't send that email. Mm -hmm. don't, don't get on the phone. I have a 24 hour rule if I can employ it. Like just don't do anything for 24 hours. After the 24 hours, you see it differently because that emotion has passed and now you're thinking thoughtfully about what to do. There's a difference. One is you're reacting to some, what somebody does, and the other thing is you're responding thoughtfully. Mm. So when you react, it's impulsive, you just go. When you respond, it means you thought it out, you put some type of strategy or tactics in place, and then you respond. It's like when we would do search warrants or arrest warrants. We didn't just go into the you know, place guns blazing and breaking doors down. It was a thoughtful, tactical breakdown of how we were going to go into that house. Where we were gonna go, who's going through the doors, who's watching the back door, who's watching the windows. Are there any guns in the house? Should we be worried? Does this person have a, a history? We put a plan in place and then we went in. We didn't go in there to be bullies or to throw down with someone. We wanted everybody to leave safely not anyone not to get hurt. I didn't want to hurt the person either that we were arresting. And just how can we do this quickly and safely? And so it's kind of that mental breakdown of situations. Mm -hmm. But the more you deal with stress, this is the thing, the more you have stress in your life, the more you're able to cope better mm -hmm. if you know how to use these situations as a learning tool. So when things happen to you, rather than completely losing your mind, take a minute, don't respond, don't do anything. And I have a term, introduce a disruptor. Mm. So a disruptor is something like you can do time. Time is a disruptor where you have time in the, in the context of the situation where you don't actually do anything. And the time helps you kind of break away from that moment. Or you can go do something. Go surfing, uh, go jump out of a plane, go, go for a run at the park. Do something that disrupts the, 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 the hamster wheel that's in your head, this person this, this person that. You need to break that. Mm. So you can do that with an activity. You can even do it with a location. Move locations, change locations, get in your car and drive. So introduce disruptors. I do that to this day. If I have a situation or something that happens that I don't like and I find myself spinning and replaying that mm. same story, which does me no good, I introduce a disruptor. I'll go to my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu class and I will get my ass handed to me on the grappling floor, or I'll go take, take a cold shower, which I don't like doing, but I do them every night. Mm. So I will do something that alters my mindset. Wow, I love that. 
So you're saying when you go in, I love what you're saying, like you're going in, you don't go in guns blazing, you have a plan, everything is, you know, thought out. In those moments, what happens, I want to go to like talk about um, like intuition and gut, because are there moments where you're in that situation and you've got a gut feeling about something, but you don't necessarily have any proof? Mm. Um, have you had that situation? And then what do you do about it? Because as a young girl, I definitely had a lot of gut, um, you know, like instincts about things, but I was always so embarrassed to say anything that I never said anything. And then I remember one time when I was about 12 years old, I was walking home from school and I just had a gut feeling someone was following me in a car and I turned around and there was this guy in a car and he's going very slow and I remember being like well if you run like he's going to think you're an idiot because you're running away from a car and then I was like but then you could die so I actually ran home and it's one of those moments that could have been so pinnacle in my life if I hadn't have listened to it so you're in these moments where there's so much on the on the line you're you know you've got this all these departments you're maybe arresting someone and you've got that gut feeling. So it's so interesting that you share that story. I cannot tell you how many women have shared s such a similar story. I had the same story happen where it was a woman, she was, a, she was an anchor that I had been on air with, and she pulled me aside. She said, you know what, a few years ago I was walking down the sidewalk, and I felt somebody behind me, and I felt uncomfortable, but he didn't do anything, he didn't say anything, and she's, mm -hmm. so she's like, I thought about crossing, crossing the street, I didn't do it because I didn't want to be rude because he'd be like, all right, lady, relax. She's like, I didn't cross the street. I stayed there. And you know what he did? He robbed me. Ooh. So my in those situations, you have my blessing to be rude. Because right, right. it's not about that. It's like let them feel offended. Or even when you're waiting online at Starbucks, if like I have one of those people who really like to be on top of me, mm -hmm. I mean, I will turn around. I'll give them a look. Or if I don't like the way I feel, I get up and leave. Mm -hmm move go don't be there so it's really about trusting your instincts if it feels wrong follow it there's actually the science that the department of defense is doing where they're researching your sixth sense and they found that it actually works in the field and they've been investing money into it to see how you can enhance that because some of the military out in the field have been um able to avoid ieds explosive devices improvised explosive devices and so when they asked them, how did you know not to go this way? I had a feeling. Mm -hmm. And so even if you can't articulate it, even if you don't understand it, if you feel it, follow it. There is a point where you have to trust in yourself. It's there for a reason. Trust yourself. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Is that a good enough reason? So let's say you're, I mean, you, you've protected so many presidents now. Um, have you had moments where you're, you just had the gut feeling? And if so, do you then follow it through? Um, like, what does that look like? Well, how that would work is there's a lot of plan and preparation. So the part that you see the agents walking around, the protectee, the president, whoever it is, mm -hmm. that's nothing. The planning and preparation that would go into the pro proactive element to securing something, going to a place, that is 80% of it. Mm. And so by the time you get there, you're pretty solid, but you've got a plan A and a plan B and a plan C for when things break bad. And if you see something that doesn't feel right, you notify the other people, hey, this looks off, what do you think? What do you think? And then collectively we make that decision. But again, if you're prepared, and this isn't just, this isn't just in protection and security, I mean in anything, mm. the more prepared you are, the more you've done your homework, the, the more you know about your stuff, you walk in not only confident, but super aware and when things go wrong, you can pivot. If you're not prepared and if you mm -hmm. haven't done the work, if you're not proactive, when things go wrong, what do you do? You lose your mind. You freeze. You don't know what to do. And so there's, there's so much of that element, but we put so much work, so much strategic, so much training, so much emphasis on preparing for securing a place, securing the person, and then the what if. None of us had this delusion. Oh, my God, I put everything in place. It's going to be perfect. <laughs> right. Despite all the manpower, all the resources, we knew that something could go wrong. No, I could never say to anybody, I 100% tell you that this person's going to be safe. I can guarantee it. Mm. I can. But what I can guarantee is all the stuff I'm going to do. And that if something does happen, I'm going to respond quickly, swiftly, thoughtfully, violently. Whatever I need to do. 
That was amazing. Um, in your business, I assume that you get confronted a lot. Um, I've heard you talk about confrontation. Most people battle it and try to fight it off, but you say welcome it. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yes. So I have a lot of folks who come up to me, what do I do? This person's confronting me. I'm nervous and I don't like to fight. And, and some people don't like confrontation. But what happens is when we go out of our way to avoid confrontation, it ends up hurting us in the end. We end up stifling our voices, we end up suffering, we end up dealing with people and things and situations where we don't speak and it's so much worse for us, not just mentally, physically, health-wise, it just demolishes you. And so embracing confrontation is a mindset that I took on, that it's like you can, you can disagree with someone and it doesn't have to be a, a full brawl. Right. You can articulate to somebody and say, I hear you, I disagree with you with this and this is why, here's my perception of that. So there's a way to disagree with someone. And if they escalate, let them escalate. Mm. If they scream, let them scream. You sit in your chair, you stay calm and collected, you remain professional, you let them become the fool. You don't have to mimic that. Mm. Sometimes in the, going back to what I used to do in the interview room, I would have people, they, they did not want to talk to me. They hated me simply because of what I represented. I represented law enforcement. Mm. And so from that moment, I'd walk into a room and people would be rude to me, scream at me, yell at me, call me names. What do I do? Do I reciprocate or do I sit back and I wait? I let them vent. And you know what? 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, they're done. They're tired. They got out of, the, out of their system. And now we can have a conversation. I love that so much. Don't, don't be afraid of it. Mm. So what? Somebody yells at you and... Somebody confronts you and embrace it. Look at it like, all right, what's up? Let's go. And I have to give my husband kudos for this because anytime the situation and there's something, I'm like, hey, this could get confrontational. He's like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I love it. Because he looks at it almost like a puzzle, like a, like a master. He's like, how, can we, how are we going to move this person? How are we going to maneuver them from here to here? Mm. And look at it as a challenge. Mm. Don't look at it as a negative thing. And you're going to have people confront you. But at the same time, you should be able to confront people about things that you don't feel right about in your life. Don't sit there and swallow it. Also, yeah, let's talk about that. How do you do that? Because typically when people go to confront other people, it's like, all right, there's going to be a battle here. They're going to get their walls up. But I've heard you talk so eloquently about the words you, you use and how you are able to confront people without it being feeling like you're being combative. What are the tricks there? Because right. I love this. Well, don't, don't take it personal and don't talk to people like they're garbage. Don't sit there and yell at people. If you yell at people and talk to them like garbage, you're going to get garbage. Mm -hmm. And so if I want information, if I'm trying to get something from you or I want to be able to understand what you're thinking, I'm going to speak to you in a way that you understand. But I will approach you one at a time when I am not angry because there are moments where I'm like, I can't speak to this person. I will not speak to this person. I need to calm down. I need okay. to think clearly. And when I, get, when I get in the right mindset, then I'll figure out how to speak to you. So let's say you're dealing with somebody who's being dishonest okay. and they've been lying to you. Well, one thing to think about is when you approach them, you don't want to say, hey, I know you've been lying to me and this is how I know. Think of it this way. Who likes to be called a liar? No one. No one likes to be called a liar. So what you can say is like, hey, Lisa, look, I feel that there's some, you know, you're not being truthful with me about everything. There's some things that you're holding back and I really want this relationship to work. So I'm hoping we can have an honest conversation and open you know, dialogue and just really kind of get to the bottom of what's going on. It'd really, really be important to me. So I can be as pissed at you as much as I want, but I would do that. I actually did this with an ex-boyfriend um, and I suspected that he was being dishonest. He was either talking to his ex-girlfriend or whatever. This was many years ago. Do you think I was livid? I was furious, but I needed to know what was going on. Mm. I was like, I need to know, I can't spend time with this person. And so I put on my non-confrontational, I'm gonna to talk to you nicely hat, and I put on my interrogator interviewer hat, and I said, you know, and I just began talking to him nicely. You know, oh, tell me about your last relationship. Wow, it sounds like it was really important to you. What was it like? That must have been hard, the breakup. Do you really think I wanna hear about her? No, <laughs> I did not. But I sat there and I remember yeah. being on the phone with him, listening to this conversation, and then eventually, his walls go down. He forgets who he's talking to. He starts telling me more and more. And as he's talking to me, I realize, oh my God, he's still talking to her. Wow. Yes. And so at that, that point, I got what I wanted. I needed knowledge to figure out, do I stay or do I go? And so because I was able to get that information, I was able to go and leave that relationship and avoid future pain. 
So there's three things you should think about when you communicate with people. Body language, verbal language, paralinguistics. Body language is how you're seated. So right now, I like you, you like me, and one of the indicators is the way our legs are crossed. Yeah. They're actually co crossed toward each other. Mm -hmm. If we didn't like each other, we'd be maybe sitting something this like way. this, I'd be a little bit more that way, so I use mm -hmm. my body as a barrier. Or even leaning in, when you like somebody, you lean in. And so this creates like, hey, I like you, let's talk. So people are more engaged. Now verbal language is kind of what we touched on before, not calling somebody a liar, watching the things you say to them. Even when I would work cases where somebody would steal money, I would never say to them, did you steal that money? Mm -hmm. Did you take that money? If somebody raped someone, I wouldn't say, did you rape her? Rape is an ugly word. Who wants to be a rapist? Did you hurt her? Right? So I would be mindful of the words that I used. And so that is the verbal language that we assess. Um, paralinguistics is how you say the things you mm -hmm. say. And so, again, based on your audience, if you have somebody who's a man who's really strong, who's a boss, you might want to... Depth, you know, deepen your voice, bring up a little bit more strength, and when you talk, project. If you're de dealing with like a young girl, you want to bring it down, soften it, match that person, mirror her language. And something as simple as, look at the words people use, like if do they like, oh, that's great, that's great, you know what I'm going to say? That's great, that's great. Mm -hmm. I even use it when I do emails. Uh, when I receive somebody's email and I, I look at how they introduce themselves. Hi, Evie, dear Evie, hello, Evie. Guess how I respond back? I look at their email. If they write hi, I write hi. Interesting. They write hello, I write hello. If they write dear, I write dear. And that's to meet them where they are? What is that purpose? To create something in common. I get you, you get me. Subconsciously, it makes them feel like, oh, I like her. She used dear, I used dear. They don't know that I'm doing that. Even right. when I close the email, sincerely, I'll put sincerely. People like people who they have things in common with. But don't pretend to be something you're not. So just bring the version of you that would resonate best with them. So you're saying, I'm not faking it, I'm just bringing out a part of me that works with that works person with better. So for example, usually when I did interviews in the past, I would bring a stronger version of me because typically I interviewed men who committed crimes. Mm. And so I had to be uh, fair and balanced, but I also had to exude a bit more strength and power, right? But I remember one occasion I interviewed a young woman. She was 22 years old. She was a babysitter, a nanny. And she had, there was a baby with a broken arm. And I had to interview her. Now, she had been interviewed about four times by state police. And they were like, she's not giving anything up. Do you want to give it a try? And I said, sure. So when I saw her and I walked into the interview room, this is my criminal now, right? Mm. She was scared. She was seated like this. Her voice was really, really soft and low. And I'm not going to come in there with the interrogator, Evie, because that would not have worked with her. Mm. But what worked with her is, hi, how are you? How's everything? I brought the version of me. It's still me right. that would work with her. Hour and a half later, confession. Wow. So it's really about paying attention to the person across from you. How do you do that? Shut up and listen to people. Talk less. I always say 80% listen, 20% talk. Mm -hmm. And especially when you first meet people and you're trying to figure them out, let them do the talking. Ask open-ended questions. And then that way, let people guide you and give you the information you need rather than guessing, what do mm -hmm. I say to this person? Who am I talking to? Let them tell you. And people love to talk about themselves. Let them knock on themselves out, you know? Let them tell you everything about themselves. And then... You figure out who they are, you figure out how they think, what's important to them, their values, their belief systems, what they want to share with you, and then you can chime in more intelligently rather than guessing or making assumptions and the wrong assumptions. So how do you do that then? So there's a woman that has, you guys think, has um, hurt this child. There's an assumption there that she has done it. She hasn't confessed. Mm -hmm. At what point do you say, oh, maybe she's not lying or... Maybe this is an assumption of ours and we are wrong. Like, how do you differentiate and how do you know when your assumptions are influencing you? Don't make assumptions. Don't assume your assumptions are facts. Mm -hmm. Is it conjecture or is it fact? And my husband always says that to me when we talk. He's like, is this an opinion? Is this what you think? Or is this what you know to be true? Mm -hmm. And so approach it from that regard. So in this situation, we had an assumption it was possibly her, but we weren't 100% sure. So when you speak to people, you have to be non-biased. Recognize, okay, I think it's this person, but I could be wrong. Mm. The way you should look at it is, I'm going in there to find out the truth. 
whether it was the nanny, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a business partner, whatever it is, I'm after the truth. How do I get to the truth? Mm. I, th I think this is it, but you also have to be aware that there's a slight possibility that I could be wrong. And so if you go in with this biased perception of like, I know this person did this. I know this person lied to me. I know this person deceived me. If you go in with that, no matter what they say to you, that narrative, whatever they say to you, you, you can make that narrative confirm with what you believe. It's confirmation yeah. bias. You can make it fit into what you want and then you'll disregard the things that don't suit you. So you say when you're going in, leave it at the door, don't go in with any type of bias, make no assumption, assume that there is that possibility. That what are you after? The yeah, truth. Yeah. You want to know something? I wanted to know that my, if my boyfriend was still talking to ex-girlfriend. Right. Every part of me wanted to be like, flip him the finger and tell him what I thought of him. But that, would that do me any good? Nope. No. And so I had an assumption. I wasn't sure. So I went in there, non-threatening, neutral conversation. Hey, I'm your BFF. Let's talk. Oh my God, that's horrible. How did you break up? Oh, it's so, I can't. <laughs> I'm so sad for you. <laughs> you really must miss her. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was really right. hard, but yeah. I had to sit through it because. You got what you wanted. Because. I needed to protect myself mm -hmm. in some way. And so I need to know what he is doing, who he is talking to. Yeah. I'm sure people ask this a lot of you, but um, what are some key things on knowing when someone's lying to you or not? So it goes back to what we talked about, body language, verbal language, and paralinguistics. So what happens with body language if someone is lying? It's easy and it's not easy. So what I want to say with this, it's really studying human behavior and really assessing the person across from you. Now, if you know someone and you're able to develop a baseline, like you know this person, you know when they're talking to you, how they typically carry themselves, and then you look for a deviation in their character. So mm -hmm. if you ask somebody a really stressful question, how are they gonna respond? I remember once I was interviewing a woman, it was for a job um, because we had to, you had to take a polygraph to get into the service. And during the interview, I had to ask her about her drug history. And the whole interview, for example, she's sitting like this, she's nodding her head, we're connecting, it's great. And the minute I start asking her about her drug experimentation, her legs started doing this. Just this, nothing else. Just up and down, up and down. So I'm watching this and I'm thinking, could be a fluke, could be something. So we talk for a little bit, we change the conversation. When I change the conversation away from drugs, her legs stopped. Then I'm thinking, okay, I need to go back to this to see if there's an issue here. So I brought the conversation back. I'm like, hey, I have another question about what we talked about earlier about your drug experimentation. And the legs oh started doing this. And so in that moment, I knew, I'm like, okay, something's bothering her with this question. Now, I didn't want to make the assumption she's a liar. Right. Could be maybe her husband does drugs, her father does drugs, or who knows, or maybe it is her. And so at that point, I become curious. And when you become curious, when you learn to read people's nuances, you become curious and then you ask, the follow-up questions. Then you start, ah, I need to pay attention, red flag. And so that's where body language comes in. Mm -hmm. What are they doing that's different from what they've done before? Because when we're stressed out, our body bleeds information. So you can sit there and be really calm and collected and lie to somebody, but sometimes the body can't control it. It's too much, there's too much happening. And you know, there's this also this, this, con this concept about eye contact. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, right. you know, look me in the eyes and tell you, tell me the truth, right? I can look you in the eyes all day long and lie, lie, <laughs> lie. So it's really just understanding that person. But if you notice mm. that I'm always looking at you in the eyes and then the minute I start to tell you something that you're concerned about, I look away. Mm. Now you're like, why did she just look away? This whole time she's looking at me in the eyes. I ask her this difficult question. Now she shifts her gaze. Mm. So you're looking, for, you're looking at the difference. What changed in me? And now with, with language... There's also things to look at in language. Just a lot of times it has to do with paying attention. So if I say to you, Lisa, you know, what time did you get home last night? And you say to me, well, you know, I usually get home around six. Did you answer mm. the question? But you'd be surprised how many people will let that go and they will move on. I didn't ask you what time you usually get home. I asked you what time did you get home last night? Because so people are trying to avoid lying directly. Is that why they do it? And yes. they hope that it slips through the cracks. It does. Well, look, people, we all know it's wrong to lie. So we don't like lying. So the, the most popular way we lie mm -hmm. is through omission. We will leave something out. We will be vague in our language. And so we really want to listen to the language. Are people answering your question? 
Um, when you ask a question, do they respond back with a question? Who, me? Are you talking to me? It could be a stalling tactic. Yes, it's me. There's nobody else in the room. It's just you and I. Who else would be asking you? And so listening to the language that people use. Also, another indicator is usually um, when we speak, we'll say I. I feel this way. I this. I went here. I that. I, I, I. What you'll tend to see in verbal language is somebody who doesn't use I, uh, it me means that there's a lack of commitment, that they're telling you something, but they're not committed to it. Mm. So think of the sentence. If I say to you, uh, miss you, love you, can't wait to see you. Okay. I miss you. I love you. I can't wait to see you. There's more of a commitment on that latter one. So mm -hmm. you can possibly assume, again, assumption, that the first person really doesn't miss you all that much, really doesn't love you all that much, doesn't care whether they see you. And so uh, there's so many clues in the things we say. Then also how we say them. You know, do people speak with conviction? Are they vague? So when it comes to deception, people who lie are typically vague because when you're lying, there's so much more you have to remember. They won't be as detailed. Mm. Wow. Yes, that I wrote was, a whole that book. That was fire, girl. <laughs> and everything is in the book that they can find. Everything and you just wrote There's so down. much stuff, but it's all great stuff. And it's all, it's all the little things. Like, there's no gimmick. There's no, right. like, here, just do these three steps right. and you will know. Yeah. It's, it's really understanding people, studying human behavior. Look, I'm fascinated by people. And everyone's unique and everybody's different. And so you want to learn people, understand people. And the more curious you are about people, the more you'll be able to read them and think what, what matters is to this person. Why would they lie to me? Mm. What, 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 would there be their, what would be their incentive, their motive? And that's where empathy comes in. Using empathy to understand somebody else's perspective. See the world not through your eyes, through their eyes. Mm. And even something simple as when I would do interviews with people, I would sit in the chair the person I would be interviewing in would sit. Because I wanted to see what does it feel like mm. to sit in this chair, where are they looking? Mm. What are they staring at? Is there a window? Is there a clock? Are they distracted by something? What does it feel like? So talk to people not the way you want to be spoken to, but the way they want to be spoken to, a way that resonates with them. And how do you do that? By talking less and listening more, because they will give you clues and insight to who they are. Ooh, God, that was fire. That was amazing. And I think I know the answer to this question because I think you just answered it, but what is your superpower? Gosh, my superpower. I fail a lot. You fail a lot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Failure is my superpower. The more I fail, the more resilient I become and the less afraid I am of it. Failure is my superpower. I love that. And where can people find you and your new book and your show that you're on and everything that you're yes. doing? So Spy Games is every Monday night on Bravo. It's 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific and then 9 p.m. Central. And then my book is called Becoming Bulletproof. And honestly, like all the stuff we talked about, it's in there. And I just took everything that I learned that I was privileged to be in the White House, to be around these extraordinary people, to go through all this training And my mindset was, how do I help people? How do I serve people? Mm. I don't want to write a book about me. I wanted to write a book that people could take and use in their everyday lives because all that stuff I use today with everything in relationships. And we're so vulnerable and there's so many things that go on around us. Like, how do we protect ourselves? Not just physically, but mentally mm -hmm. and from people. You know, even people that don't mean to harm us, harm us. And so how do you, how do you navigate that world? So it's Becoming Bulletproof. You can get it on Amazon. It comes out uh, in April. And so I'm really excited about that because, again, like, I just I want it to help people. And I really think it's a book that really can. Amazing. And where can people follow you? Oh, common spelling Greek name, at <laughs> Evie Pompurus. So at E-V-Y Pompurus and then P-O-U-M-P-O-U-R-E-S. Amazing. We'll put all the links in the show yes, notes as yes. well. Guys, guys, I have been waiting for this episode and dying to get this woman on for God knows how long. And so I am a giddy child right now. I'm so freaking excited that she was able to sit here and give all those words of wisdom. Go buy her book. Go follow her. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed to this channel, guys, and you do feel like this is bringing you value, please, please do click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. 
What up, guys? Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.